Thank you, everyone. One point in regard to my presentation. Its subject matter demands that I show you some slides of text, but you are not required to read them. Some will be unreadably small. Some is even in Latin. I'll highlight with a red line anything I want you to notice. Try instead to view the slides as visual images, graphics. Indexing his way into further enlightenment, discovering Swedenborg's process through translation. And by translation here, I mean both the rendering of Latin words in English and also the editing and reference checking that go along with it. My thesis, briefly put, is that what I might call Swedenborg's index-like and cross-reference material, where there's a statement followed by a string of numbers, has more value than we give it credit for. In his published theological works, this index-like material is presented, broadly speaking, in one of three ways. Number one, as a momentary cross-reference inserted into the flow of the main text. Or two, as an author's footnote to the main text. There are two of them here. Or three, as a solid block equivalent to his main text. And why would I link these together? They're all based on Swedenborg's indexes. In fact, the same content sometimes appears in one place as one type of text and in another place as another. Swedenborg, of course, also had other kinds of indexes. At the end of two of his later theological works, Marriage, Love, and True Christianity, he published an index of memorable occurrences or memorable relations. Plus, many indexes survive that he left in manuscript form, and we know there were still more that have not survived. This kind of material has often been treated by later editors and translators as inferior to the main text. Admittedly, the first kind of index-like material, the embedded cross-reference, has been preserved in later editions, but people producing audio versions may understandably omit it. And of course, readers presumably generally skip it. The second kind of index-like material, the author's footnotes, have often actually been omitted from the printed editions and translations, or in other cases, moved to the back of the book. And I'm especially interested in the third kind of index-like material, which perhaps reaches its peak in Swedenborg's 1758 work, New Jerusalem equals New Jerusalem and its heavenly doctrine. This published theological work has 23 chapters, most of which are followed by a block of index-like text. In fact, the index-like material constitutes some 69% of the text. The New Century Edition, or NCE, has recently issued George Dole's fresh and wonderfully readable English translation of New Jerusalem, including all the index-like material. It is a cornerstone of, of our approach that we include everything in Swedenborg's first edition. I was shocked to find recently that this NCE version is the first time that that index-like material has been translated into English in 106 years. Since it fills the page and is separate from the main text, this material was presumably considered easier to remove than embedded cross-references. So it seems as though the larger such text is, the more inclined we are to get rid of it. For more evidence that this material has been seen as secondary, consider how Potts' concordance handles it. Although the concordance takes great pains to represent Swedenborg's doctrinal main text, when it comes to index-like material, Potts merely summarizes it as Refs to passages, refs to passages, refs to passages. Now, all of this is understandable if we consider this material to be a normal index, because an index is by nature a mere humble servant, is it not? It is a signpost, a pointer, a hyperlink, directing one to where the real action is. But is that all this was? While this material may not be very important to us, 
I would argue that it was very important to Swedenborg both the activity of producing this material and the resulting product seem to have been of great significance to him. To lay this out, I need to broaden the scope a bit to include his behind-the-scenes indexes as well. Before his spiritual eyes were opened, Swedenborg included indexes in some of his published works. These were brief and normal. Here in Dynamics of the Soul's Domain, Volume 1, for example, there is a seven-page index, or a rate of one page of index for every 55 pages of text. And the wording of the index simply reflects the wording of the main text. One page here gets you all the way from C to F. But something changed after Swedenborg's spiritual eyes were opened. Indexing became more important to him. Consider the fact that the first major thing he wrote then was a series of six indexes to the Bible that total 2,515 pages. And by the third of these six, he began including the spiritual meaning of the text, a departure from mere signposting. And yet all of those 2,515 pages have never been considered worthy of translation or representing in English. Consider also the fact that at that same time, Swedenborg began writing down his spiritual experiences and then went over these and indexed them at a rate of one page of index for every two pages of text. Four volumes of main text, two volumes of index. And anyone who has worked on that material can tell you that his index entries are differently worded, clearer, and sometimes even longer than the thing they are supposedly just indexing. Yet to the best of my knowledge, this material has never before been translated into any language. The first ever translation is being done as we speak by Reverend Kurt Nemitz for the General Church Translation Committee. It has not been all that important to us, but it was apparently very important to Swedenborg. Consider also the humble fact that Swedenborg's published theological works and those major unpublished works that were being considered for publication have sequential section numbers that run from beginning to end and even across volume boundaries. Swedenborg adopted this practice, no doubt, so that he could index and cross-reference his works before pages were typeset. Proof of this is found in his Revelation Explained, which equals Apocalypse Explained, which stops abruptly long before it was completed, but already has abundant cross-references in it. Swedenborg must have created an index for this work, too, but it has not survived. In fact, let's consider how Swedenborg's published theological writings begin. After the title page of his first published theological work, Secrets of Heaven equals Arcana Celestia, but before you even reach number one, what do you find? A string of forward cross-references and an index of spiritual experiences. After he finished Secrets of Heaven, in 1758, Swedenborg published five works in one year. Stuart Shotwell, managing editor for the New Century Edition, recently made this fascinating observation. When you arrange them in the order in which they were originally written, the amount of index-like material increases. In other planets, OP there, which is Earth's in the universe, such material, as represented by the dark part at the bottom, constitutes 6% of the work, all of it in the form of author's footnotes. In Heaven and Hell, that amount rises to 19% and is present in both footnotes and as block text at the end of chapters. In Last Judgment, that amount rises to 22%, again in both footnotes and as block text. In New Jerusalem, as I say, that amount rises to 69%, and none of it is in footnote form. It is all block text at the end of chapters. And in Whitehorse, that amount rises again to 80%. And again, none of it is in footnotes. It forms one large appendix 
after a brief chapter of biblical exegesis. Can we maintain that this material was unimportant to Swedenborg? While we're at it, let's consider how Swedenborg's published theological works end with an index. Just as they began, they end with an index of spiritual experiences. At the end of True Christianity, there is a 47-page index of these experiences, which includes many details not covered in the main text and ends beautifully with a whole additional memorable occurrence, all of which has often been cut. For details, see my translator's preface to True Christianity, Volume 2, in the deluxe purple edition. So indexing was not superfluous to what Swedenborg was doing. It was an integral part from start to finish. And the nature of these indexes went beyond what is normal. More evidence of how important this material was to Swedenborg is how much work he put into it. Let's consider how he produced the index-like material that constitutes that 69% of New Jerusalem. John Eliot made a significant contribution to our understanding in his wonderful Latin edition of Swedenborg's indexes to Arcana Celestia. He points out there that there are two types of material in these indexes. This led Stuart Shotwell and me to realize that what is present in New Jerusalem is yet a third type. That is, this material took a threefold process to create. Let me explain. First, Swedenborg would go through Secrets of Heaven, paragraph by paragraph, and write an entry in his index under some appropriate keyword. I don't expect you to be able to see this, but in this index entry for the Latin word heart, all the numbers are in sequential order, starting at the top with 170 and ending at the bottom with 9,300. So he went through in sequence. The result is a numerically ordered but topically random list of statements with usually just a single reference at the end of each. This is what we call first order index-like material. Then Swedenborg would reread this and copy it over, but resort the information into a new synthesis. We're so fortunate as to have an example from this very same material about the heart. Hopefully you can see at least that the format of the text has changed here. In this particular example about the heart, Swedenborg has taken all the mentions of the will in the previous slide and combined them into one statement with a string of numbers at the end. Then he took all the mentions of love from the first one and did the same with a string of numbers at the end. The result is a series of individual disconnected statements, but they now have more topical density and each has a string of numbers at the end. This is what we call second order index-like material. Finally, Swedenborg would take that second order material and rework it yet again, rearranging the points and crafting them into paragraphs of prose, which is what we call third order index-like material. At times, he even provides it with internal headings. I don't have an example about the heart, so let's look at one from the NCE New Jerusalem about the inner and outer self instead. Note the presence now, highlighted here, of a flow from one statement to the next with connective tissue and logical markers that I've highlighted here. In fact, you can ignore the references and read this as regular prose. I'll read it to you. The outer things in us are relatively remote from the divine, so they're more obscure and general reference. They are also relatively disorganized references. Now that also wouldn't happen in a normal index entry. Inner things are more perfect because they're closer to the divine references. There are thousands upon thousands of things in our inner self that appear as one general thing in the outer self reference. So the more inward our thinking and perception are, the clearer they are reference. It follows then Index entries don't start with it follows then. That never happens. It follows then that we should concentrate on what lies in the deeper levels. References. 
George Stoll, by the way, in my humble opinion, did a wonderful job of coming up with idiomatic and impactful renderings of this material. So, wait a minute. Given that Swedenborg wrote a rough copy and a fair copy of the works he published, was it not enough that he wrote out the 4,563 pages of Secrets of Heaven by hand with a quill pen twice, but he also went back and indexed it three times? We are welcome, of course, to omit the resulting material, but let's at least hold in our hearts that a lot of work went into it. It's like a couple and one says to the other, did you by any chance throw out the stuff in the brown pot from the fridge in the basement? Yeah, it was just old cabbage. Well, that old cabbage was actually sauerkraut I was making. I pounded that for hours and it has been brewing for three weeks. Oops, sorry about that. Likewise with Swedenborg's index-like material. It may look at first like old cabbage to us, but we should at least realize he worked hard on that and felt it was important, but even more significant than the sheer amount of work it took is that the resulting material contains things Swedenborg never said elsewhere. This is not generally recognized, but anyone who has worked at checking cross-references in Swedenborg's works can attest that doing so is a nightmare. Why? Let me give you an example from a parenthetical cross-reference in Secrets of Heaven 9410. Note the wording here in the redesigned standard edition, that regeneration goes on up to the end of man's life in the world and afterward to eternity. See all these glorious references. So here is a statement followed by not one, not two, but 36 references in five groups. Imagine you are the reference checker. Okay, here we go, you say to yourself. To verify these references, all I need to do is find that statement in those passages and put in a check mark. So you read 8548. Well, it's about the need for rebirth in order to go to heaven, but the passage says nothing about regeneration going on throughout our life and after death to eternity. 8549 and 8550 and so on are also about regeneration, but say nothing of the kind. Mm. You keep checking. Along the way, you learn that regeneration is needed because our life is upside down to begin with, that we can't be regenerated unless we know some truth, that both our inner and our outer self have to be regenerated. You learn that our ruling love is a key element and cannot be changed after death. Hmm. But none of it fits the bill with the exception of the word regeneration. In the last batch of 12 passages, though, 8958 to 8969, after learning that temptations are needed for regeneration, in the third to last passage, you read that our spiritual self eventually gets the upper hand and our lower self over our lower self, and we gain, quote unquote, intelligence and wisdom, which afterward increase day by day. We gain intelligence and wisdom, which afterward increase day by day, end quote. Now you get a little excited. Perhaps in the last two passages, you'll see the thing that you've been looking for. But no. So wait a minute. What was that opening sentence again? That regeneration goes on up to the end of man's life in the world and afterward to eternity. See these 36 passages. Did we really just read 36 passages to find nothing more than the word regeneration and the statement that intelligence and wisdom afterward increase day by day, which doesn't even directly say that regeneration continues and says nothing about whether it goes on after death. Afterward there, quote unquote, is arguably vague in comparison with throughout your life into eternity. So do you as reference checkers say, it's all good, two thumbs way up. Are those, in fact, the references that Swedenborg intended? I believe they are because they point so precisely to 36 passages on regeneration. But what then is going on? My working theory 
is that Swedenborg reads those 36 passages and has a new insight and puts it in the statement with the list of numbers. In fact, in the manuscript, it is literally added in the margin, sideways. All the passages referred to give supportive information and presumably even led to Swedenborg's insight, but the resulting cross-reference does not function like a normal index entry would. This may drive the reference checkers crazy, but for the same reason, its value is higher than we thought. It says something new. And this is just one of many examples. Back in the day, there were no electronic search tools, but now we can search all the Latin in a heartbeat. And yet, in checking references in New Jerusalem, we found a great many instances in which a phrase used in the index-like material was the first time Swedenborg ever wrote those words. Let me give you one more example. This is from that index at the end of True Christianity, which I discuss in the translator's preface to the NCE Volume 2. As I approach translating that index, I myself thought I could just cut and paste the language from what I'd already translated. Silly me. That turned out to be completely impossible. For example, in True Christianity, number 110, we read about a person who had fallen out of heaven because of the way he viewed the Trinity. The shading on this slide indicates words in the main text that are not copied into the index, which is a perfectly normal, appropriate situation. And it talks about how this person had fallen out of heaven, and it was because he had voiced certain beliefs about God the Father and God the Son being two and not one. So here is Swedenborg's index entry for that passage, and the bold at the end, if you can see that, is 10 lines of additional information with details that appear only in the index entry, not in the main text. And that, my friends, is not normal for an index. It talks about how the angels support their points from the word, that they use this rational argumentation. And he adds that when he was in heaven, he actually spoke in terms of one God, but because he was thinking too, he got thrown out. And so all this detail is in there. But think about it. In a way, doesn't this make sense, considering Swedenborg's state? I mean, it's not like there was an Enlightenment switch that Swedenborg turned on for writing his main text and then carefully turned off when he was cross-referencing and indexing. But of course, he, he wouldn't have had an electric switch with English labels anyway. It would have been some 18th century lever with labels in Latin. Vade means go, and subsiste means stop. But he had no such switch. And why would he want to shut off his enlightenment anyway? while he was indexing. What would be the point? Put yourself in Swedenborg's shoes for a moment. The Lord has appeared to you, and heaven is open to you. But it's confusing, and your whole world is being turned upside down. So much of what you have been taught is wrong, and you have to relearn and retool your mind. Consider that the first appearance of an inner meaning to the Bible surfaces in passages in Swedenborg's Bible indexes. And perhaps you have seen how seemingly random the entries in the main text of spiritual experiences are, or what was known as a spiritual diary. But then look at the index of spiritual experiences. That material has been brought into much greater order. And aren't those reworded, clearer, sometimes longer entries evidence that Swedenborg was coming to greater understanding as he reflected on what he had written? He can't shut off his enlightenment and wouldn't want to. And what's he going to do once he has an insight? Rewrite the whole spiritual experiences? No, put it in the index. Do it now. And that example from Secrets of Heaven 9410. Perhaps Swedenborg reads those passages and has a new realization about the eternity of regeneration. Well, what do we expect him to do? Reissue Secrets of Heaven starting over again? No, there's no time for that. Just put it in the statement, show the passages that shed that light for him, and move on. How perfect is it, my friends, that the end of his entire published corpus is an index that includes not only some striking additions that we were just talking about,
but also a fresh new experience never published elsewhere. So he has a vision after finishing the main work. What's he going to do? Stop the presses and redo true Christianity to fit it in? No. Put it in the index and print the volume. To summarize and conclude, what I might call Swedenborg's index-like and cross-reference material, where there's a statement followed by a string of numbers, has been treated as having secondary importance, perhaps because it appears to merely repeat things already said in his main text. But careful study of that material, of the kind that occurs when translating, editing, and checking it, reveals that it contains new insights and wording that is not present elsewhere in his works, and therefore it is primary, highly evolved material, and deserves more love and respect. After all, Swedenborg still had enlightenment while cross-referencing and indexing. In fact, there's evidence that rereading helped shape and deepen his understanding. Index, indexing was, of course, not the source of his inspiration, but in the act of considering again what he had written, I believe he would gain new light, and that indexing and cross-referencing therefore played a key role in shaping his theological works from beginning to end. Thank you, my friends.